My goodness, I love this church. Such a delight to be here. From my perspective, you, what you probably see, and you probably know more than this, is a lot of talented musicians today. A lot of gifted people here. But what I see, you know, from where I see it and been hanging around a few years, is uh, behind these musicians are people who have a genuine love for the Lord and they're wanting to express it. And you did that so well today, so beautifully. What a treasure this day has been so far. So it would be awful to have a bad message follow up. <laughs> so pray for me. They've given me a lot to live up to here. But we have a wonderful text, a beautiful text of Scripture, and uh, there's no question about that. For many years, Lois and I have exhausted ourselves and we have exhausted our resources to make sure that Christmas was a happy memory for our children. And all eight of them would say, we succeeded. They each have a love for Christmas and they participate joyfully in it. Our firstborn will come, up with, come out with his Christmas playlist before Thanksgiving. He'll send it out to the family and you can watch Instagram and see all the stuff that they're doing to get ready for Christmas. Holly's our second born. She's out on the West Coast and we get to see what they do out there in Oregon to celebrate Christmas. And, uh, and then Chuck, he's a, you know, he's a pastor and he really loves Christmas and you can see that from watching his family and all the little things he does with them or a lot of the things that we did with him. And uh, so that's kind of fun. Heidi has, is a mom and has two little ones, and she loves to go places and do Christmas things, and it's fun to watch that, and uh, has a great love for Christmas. And uh, Hannah, too, and they got little Jaleesia, and we get pictures of little Jaleesia, there's her foster child, and, and uh, she, uh, she always has a little, she, she, we can't see pictures of her on, on the internet publicly because she's a foster child, so she has a little heart over her face or a little snowflake over her face. And so sometimes I'll just send Hannah a picture and I'll or send me, Hannah a text and say, send me a picture of Jalicia so I can see her face. And then she'll send me a picture of her and she's got her little Christmas set. I would like to have the money they spend on her clothes. <laughs> and... Uh, She's a spoiled little thing, and uh, that's kind of cute. Danny is down in Florida. It's fun to be a pastor. You can talk about your kids, your grandkids publicly, and I'm, he's down in Florida, and you can see they get three boys and all the stuff, the Christmas stuff they're doing with them. And Wes has two girls and a, and a little boy coming, and uh, he probably is one of the most, of all of our kids, he loves Christmas maybe almost the most, all they all do. Hope he's with us today. Hope he's a married woman and the professional nail person. She nails it every day. <laughs> Where's Leo? Did you get that? I, well, you should be in our elders meetings because actually <laughs> Leo was on a bit of a roll yesterday at the elders meeting. Probably a half a dozen really wonderful puns. Anyway, hope he nails it every, every day. And now this time of year she's doing Christmas nails. Now I love this because she makes a lot of money doing that. And after all of that, Lois, are exhausting our efforts and our resources. Now the children are making money of their own. And you've noticed that. And, um, and now packages are arriving from Amazon. And, uh, and, Lo and I, I'm warning Lois, don't open those packages. They might be for you. And she says, don't you open it. Now we have the ethics of, do our parents allowed to open Amazon packages ahead of Christmas? Let's vote on this. How many of you say, nothing wrong with that? Raise your hand. Nothing wrong with that. Here, I'm with you. And how many of you say that would be like Grinchy of you? No. Yeah, look at you. You would never do that, Ed. You wouldn't open that package. Just leave it sit there, no matter what. Package came yesterday. I hid it away. I thought, that isn't for me. That's probably for Lois. And I got to hide this away. Lois gets home from work and says, where's my package? I'm like, you knew there was a package? She says, I ordered it. I'm like, you're lying to me. I'm like, don't lie to me about your package. She, so she said, no, I ordered it for myself. And I said, okay, well, hold on. And so I went to my secret location and I got the package and gave, gave her her package. Part of the fun and the wonder and the, the, of, of, and the mystery of the way we do Christmas is just anticipation, isn't it? We got something to look forward to. If it's gifts that we're going to receive, 
one of my kids called and says, Dad, have you, do, you, do you have a wish list? I'm like, I have curated my wish list. I've kept it up to date. Let me send you a link. This is not my first Christmas. I know what I'm doing here because I'm looking forward to it. Delay the anticipation. Something's coming. Something wonderful is going to happen. Something coming, but it's not here yet. You have to wait for it. Advent is that. It's, it's greater than what we were talking about with those gifts from Amazon. Advent's a promise and a delay. And you may have heard this before, but much of the Christian life and much of Christian truth is already not yet. Have you heard that? You have to wait for it. It's an already not yet proposition. Promises have been made and they have been fulfilled in Christ on our behalf, but they have not yet been fully realized sometimes. It's like the Christmas gifts that are currently under the tree at, out on Bittersweet Farm right now, and they are mine, 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 mine. But like, there's probably a toolkit under there. I'm pretty sure there's a toolkit. But if something broke, Lois, you would have to fix it because my toolkit's under the tree. <laughs> so I can't, you might have to fix it anyway because even with the toolkit, I'm, I'm not Dan Haynes, let's just say that. And, 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 uh, but it's a little bit like that. It's like we, we've been given things, they're bought and paid for. They are ours, they're ours in Christ. And yet there's a sense in which we have not fully realized them. Now, you may have already figured out that the drama of Ruth is an all, has an already not yet element in it. It's about something that happened a long time ago, but has a hint of foreshadowing, maybe even a type of something wonderful that will happen in the future. The ancient story of Ruth foreshadows of all things Christmas. And that's why we've used it for the last four weeks as we have reenacted, as we have remembered the waiting and the, for the redemption of Israel. Remember the account of Luke where Anna surfaces in it, says she and her friends were doing what? Waiting for the redemption of Israel. They were waiting for the redemption of Israel. And that beautiful narrative arc of redemption is a significant feature in this beautiful story of Ruth. Did you read it this week? I'm just wondering now, here is a, an ingredient in the secret sauce of making messages really meaningful. Preparation. You wouldn't really want to hear a message that I didn't work hard at preparing. You would expect that I would work to prepare that message and to think about that text and to answer some questions. Let me tell you what will make a message exponentially greater than that, and that is not just my preparation, but your preparation. And in our church, we're a Bible teaching, Bible preaching church. Our classes are based on the Bible. Our preaching is based on the Bible. And you know this, but I like to repeat it every once in a while because it's an ingredient in the secret sauce of making messages really effective. And that is usually we're going to be going to the next chunk in the passage of Scripture that we're teaching. And the message is going to be based in the next chunk so you know where we're going. If you get lost or confused, you can always shoot me a text, call the church office, and we'll let you know. The text for next week, usually we'll know, almost always, the text for next week is this. And a good, so a good pastor, a good elder, a good pastor, will always look at people and think, to, to, has that person repented? A good pastor will always look at a person in their mind, they'll think, has that person believed? Someday we have to give an answer to God for the people that we had influence over. Did they repent? Have they believed in Jesus? And then right after that, what would a, a good pastor would always say, are they baptized? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? You obey Jesus and his commands. And his first command after repent and believe was, I wanted you to say it. Let's try that again. His first command after repent and believe was, be baptized. Go to all the world. Uh, make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them. So there's a sense in which a person that's stubborn about being baptized isn't really following Jesus. And the, one of the first things that he said, this is super important. This is a very important thing. Jesus said it's important, it's important. And so I look at a person, I think, ha have they repented? Have they believed? Have they followed the Lord in baptism? And after that, it goes different directions. It might be, have they forgiven their mother? <laughs> it might be, do they love their mother? It might be, have they charge God with unfaithfulness because of the hardships that they've had. But it often is 
do they regularly read their Bible? Now, this is a planned rabbit trail. Like last week, I had one. This is this week's planned rabbit trail. So I didn't, this is not by accident. This is very important pastoral work that I'm doing. And that is, we're coming to the first of the year. Um, we've had uh, our, uh, our elders that have your care on their heart come to me personally with a burden. <laughs> John, I don't think you'd mind me telling you, John Lemon has come two or three times. And the Lord has burdened his heart for you that you would be in the Word. And if, John, I know I'm out of school here a little bit, but he'll talk about reading the Bible with his granddaughters on the, on the YouVersion Bible app, and they can hold him accountable, and he can see what they're doing because it's important to him to be in the Word. And he meets with some friends and has met for years and years and years to hold one another kind of accountable to read the Word. Can I just say to you, if you want to have, if the, the message be meaningful to you, read the passage ahead of time and ask questions of the passage and be in the Word. And I would even suggest maybe you get a prayer partner, uh, just another person that loves the Lord, that every once in a while you could touch base with them, like after church, before you go home, while, just as the strains of the euphonium and piano are playing or organ are playing, then you're kind of leaning your heads together and how are you doing, brother and sister? Let me pray for you. What a beautiful thing that would be. Then you're on your way or you make a phone call or you send a text or maybe you grab coffee and you have a prayer partner and you say, I'm in the word and, and not to brag, that's, that's yucky, but in order to be accountable to make your way through God's Word, I strongly recommend that you figure out a way this coming year to regularly move the ribbon in Bible reading, no matter how old you are. How, or hope, I'm sorry, hope you remember when you were, you were young, and I said, well, why don't you just read through the living Bible? Hope you, one of my happiest memories is the year that every time I looked up, you were there with your little green padded living Bible, and you're just reading through the living Bible. Every time I see one of those green padded living Bible, I remember that year. What a sweet thing. It's like, she might have been faking, you know, just to make me feel good, but no, she was actually reading the Bible. And, and that's where the Heavenly Father is pleased to see that we love Him and that we love His Word and we need His Word. Can I just say as a pastor and on behalf of the other elders who care for you, let's figure out a way to be in the Word this year. Let's move the ribbon. Doesn't matter how fast you move. Doesn't matter if you goof up every once in a while and you skip a few days. Everybody, I think, does that. But have a plan of some kind and maybe have a partner that you can talk to. It might be your mate, might be somebody else, might be a child, might be a friend. And we'd love to see you do that. You can let us know. And that's the basis really of a grow group is just people that are getting together one-on-one -on -one, talking about their Christian life. Our church will, our, our, our faith of our individual people will deepen, even the youngest ones, as they study the Word of God together. But one of the things that we do is we say, hey, we're going to be in Ruth 4. And so if you read Ruth 4 and you ask yourself the question, who are the characters here? What is God saying? What happened here? Where are they? Why did God have whoever wrote this write this to whoever he wrote it to? And by the way, who wrote it and who did he write it to? You just ask some questions. You don't even have to answer them. If you read the text every week and you ask questions of the text, then whoever occupies the pulpit on Sunday morning will be a fascinating preacher because he will be just talking about the thing that you were thinking about. So I say that, it's very important, that's what I would like to call the part of the secret sauce of the elements of making uh, preaching really meaningful. And so if you read Ruth 4, you know that's the next chunk. And you might ask the question now, so where are we in this story? We're in Act 4. And so let's review. And to review, I have lifted a review from the ESV Study Bible. Let me read to you what it says. This is a synopsis of of the drama so far in Ruth chapters 1, 2, and 3. In the period of the judges, Elimelech, Naomi, and their sons leave Bethlehem because of a famine to sojourn in Moab. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, dies there. Malon and Kilion, the sons, marry Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. Ten years later, the sons die leaving no children. Naomi is bereft of family. Learning that the famine in Israel is over, she decides to return to Bethlehem. Orpah stays behind, but Ruth accompanies Naomi, and it's harvest time. Ruth goes to glean in a field that happens to belong to Elimelech's relative, Boaz. Naomi knows he is an eligible kinsman redeemer, 
Following Naomi's daring plan in a midnight encounter at the threshing floor, Ruth boldly asked him as a redeemer to marry her. Now there's a delay and a complication, and this is act four, and then it will be Christmas. So this is the text. When we read it, you'll see there are three chunks in the text, three scenes in the fourth act of the drama of Advent we call Ruth. The, the first scene is in verses 1 through 12, where Boaz redeems Ruth and Naomi and their property. So let's read that now. You remember where we left off? Son of War, chapter 4 and verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. And so they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to a relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of these sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he, this friend, this nameless dude, says, I will redeem it. Are you following this story? Is this good or bad? Yes. Kind of bad, kind of bad. If this is a television drama, and it's not, but if it is, we go to a commercial right now, <laughs> right? You get your popcorn, you come back, you, know, you pause it, you, you talk to your sister on the phone a little bit, then you start the thing back up again. But we're at a seam in the story where it's like, oh, no. Because we kind of had Ruth and Boaz together. We thought that's where that was going. But there is a nearer redeemer, and he knows a bargain when he sees it. And so Boaz has wisely, has attention to God's law, to Israel's civil law, God's law for Israel. And he's keeping a law. He's not doing any shenanigans here. He's not beating another guy out of his stuff. He's honestly, he said, he said here, I'm going to do this up front. I want everybody to be here. I want all the elders. Are all the elders paying attention right now? And then he offers it, and he says, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the devil worshiper. I mean, Ruth. Uh, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in its inheritance. And the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. And a cheer goes up from the crowd, like things are looking better now. He says, I want the property, but I wouldn't want it to go to somebody else. And for whatever reason, I'm really not sure about this whole Ruth the Moabitess thing. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. This is getting official now, right? They're at the title company. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon. And then verse 10 is kind of sweet. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers from the gate of this native place. You are witnesses this day. Music is playing in the background now. Really cool music is playing in the background. Is Ruth there? Is Naomi there? Scriptures don't tell us, but I think I would be there if I was being bought and sold like that. Who's going to buy me? Who's going to own me? Can you imagine? This is a this is amazing. And that's, a, that's the first scene of the fourth act. 
And what you have then next in the text, verses 13 through 17, is the second scene in the fourth act. And that scene is what we would call denouement, the, the wrap-up of all the loose. It's the part of the movie what, or the part of the story that you get to when all the loose ends come together and now everything makes sense. And generally speaking, you have that really good feeling in your heart like, ah, oh, this is the way things ought to be. This is exactly what happens in the second from the last scene of the fourth act, which is found in verses 13 through 17. Let's take a look at that. I'm sorry, I didn't read verse 11, so we obviously then, then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in efforts and be renowned in Bethlehem. Among other things, they're saying, may you have a very fruitful marriage. That's kind of what they're getting at. And good. And then, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you, this young woman. And the, probably the emphasis there would, even though this is a Gentile wife. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Now we have a baby in Bethlehem. And the women speak up again. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. May his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you as a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. The ladies in Bethlehem said, Call him a servant of the Lord. They weren't missing it. He was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. That's the close of the second scene of the fourth act in the drama. And it is the denouement. It's the, it's the beautiful wrap-up. What's the point of the story? Have you thought about that? What, what is the point of the story? Well, God, Yahweh, rewards those who trust him. The simplest way to say it is, what is Ruth saying? The, the, the story of Ruth says, God, Yahweh, Israel's God, the one true God, the creator God, the God of the Bible, the God of our Lord and Savior Jesus, that one, the God of the Bible is God, and he rewards those who trust him and who obey him. It says it over and over again. It says it in a whole bunch of different ways. And the idea would be, therefore, you want to trust and obey him, and he will reward you. That's definitely, it says that, but it says more than that. It also says other things. And we see them when we examine a couple of things. So let's take a look at it again this way. Let's look at those three key characters. There are others, but there are these three key characters in the story. You have Boaz, and you have Ruth, and you have Naomi. You're paying attention. Yeah, you have Boaz, and you have Ruth, and you have Naomi. Let's ask the question, how did they trust and obey? How did they trust and obey? And then let's ask the question, and how did God reward each of them? How did they trust and obey? And how did God reward? Let's look at that briefly. So Ruth chose to trust and obey Yahweh. And it's given in the most beautiful and poetic, probably one of the high points of the text, is in chapter 1 when she's weeping on the road from Moab to Bethlehem. And Orpah goes away. And then Ruth talks to Naomi. And it's in verse 16 of chapter 1. Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. Oh my, what a turning point. And Ruth, have you come to the road between Moab and Bethlehem where you said, God, God of the Bible, you are my God. Where you die, I will die. And there, I will be buried. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Ruth didn't say, 
I know it's going to be better in Bethlehem and we're going to be wealthy and I'll marry somebody who's rich and handsome and wonderful and so therefore I will follow you. She said, let's all go die together because I want your God to be my God. You need to just bury me where they bury you. Where you die, I will die. There I'll be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more if anything but death parts me from you. How did Ruth show her faithfulness in this this vow to follow God and, and to be good to Naomi. And she's loyal, she's modest, she's hardworking, she's trusting, she's humble, she is, uh, wor- she is named worthy later. That's how she trusted him. And then there's Boaz. How did, how did he trust God? Well, he chose to trust and obey Yahweh as well. He was the kind of man that blessed his workers. Remember that? He came in the field And they said, God bless you too. And they blessed him. He was the kind of man that would point people to God when nobody else was talking about God. And Ruth wasn't even bringing up God. Boaz, Ruth is saying, you're wonderful. She's on her face and she's saying, you're wonderful. And he says, it's God, it's not me, it's God. He's that guy. That's how he trusted God. He he takes his resources, his resourcefulness, Um, He doesn't deceive the near kinsman. He doesn't violate God's law. He holds God's law in his team. He blesses others, and he points out how others should trust in God. That's how Boaz trusted God. And how did Naomi trust God? Well, in spite of bitter circumstances, she trusted and obeyed Yahweh, even though it was very hard for her, and there were bitter, bitter law. Can you imagine the loss of a husband and two sons? Can you imagine... When she came back to town and her friends, oh, Naomi, she says, call me Mara, call me bitter. You don't have any idea all the bad things that have happened. I had some, I, I wondered about you when I was writing this message and I wondered about what only God knows what each of you have suffered. You just never know what people have suffered. Sometimes even young people have terrible things happen to them. And some of the worst things that happen to you, you just can't tell other people about. You have to suffer kind of alone. And they can royally mess you up, am I right? Yet there is one whose hand is unseen, who knows everything and controls everything, who knows what you have suffered. And will he reward those who trust him who have suffered? Yes, he will. And so we come to this, and their testimony of trust and obedience should inspire trust and obedience in us. So I would ask you, where is your trust being tested right now? Young man, young man, by God's providence, you've come to be among us today. Would people see in you a heart that trusts in God? Where is your trust in God being tested, and will you be faithful? And how outstanding would it be for you to be in this blasphemous irreverent age to be a truster in the one true God, a young man who resolutely puts his trust in God. What would that look like for a young man? What what would it look like for a young lady or for an older couple? You know, the sunset years of their life and now you have trials you never even thought about when you were young. How has God asked you to trust him? What has God said for you? What is your test of trust? It, and, and we have in Naomi and in Ruth and in Boaz, we do have examples of people who trusted God. And they trusted God aside from miraculous things happening around them all the time. This is a key part of the story. A key part of the story is God is in it, but it doesn't just keep saying God is in it. it, it as a matter of fact, the narrator, almost tongue in cheek, always says, then it just happened. And then it just happened, and that guy just happened to be there that morning, and Boaz just, and she just happened to find Boaz's field. It's almost tongue-in-cheek. It's, the idea there is that, do you understand that the big idea of Ruth is that God rewards those who trust him and obey him, and, and he rewards them sometimes by his providential arrangement of things, not by his miraculous hand. And then you should be paying attention, like, yeah, that's the way it is in my life. We've all, you've seen only a few miracles, if any, but his providential hand is always working in your life. 
This is what we're supposed to learn when we see this story. It looked like just an ordinary widow lady and another ordinary widow lady and an ordinary landowner in an ordinary place, and it just happened to do this. This happened. To, no, God is weaving a story that people will read throughout eternity and enjoy throughout eternity, and it will stir the faith of people for eternity. That's what God is doing with these ordinary people through his sovereign providence. <laughs> A little extra, no extra charge. I was reading John Piper's book on providence. Early in the book, he gives seven reasons that God displays his providence in Scripture. One reason is to humble human pride. One reason is to intensify human worship. Can I get an amen from the faithful on that one? I, yes, God, you're in charge of everything. One is to shatter human hopelessness. You know, you have a terrible turn, but you know God is in it. One is a ballast in the boat of faith. It's to steady your faith. One is to steal our courage. One is to make us glad in a fiction. One, one, one is to help us to love when we see no way forward. There you, there you have it. Now, this is important, but it's not the emphasis. It's not the main emphasis of the story. Because the main emphasis of the story is, is actually... Been with, has been withheld so far. We saw how, how they trusted and obeyed. Let's look quickly at how God blessed those who trusted him. Let's look at Ruth. She experiences a providential kindness from God. And this is a special Hebrew word for it, hesed. Over and over again, and, and scholars, students of the Bible, scholars of the Hebrew, I'm not, they will study that and they will say, there's no way to translate this word adequately. It is a word that means God's loving kindness, favor poured out on unworthy people. His goodness, his loving kindness. And Ruth is the object of God's kindness. Ruth the Moabitess is the object of God's deliberate kindness. Now that would be good. This would be good. Ruth experiences a providential kindness, the hesed of God. She experiences the rest that she longed for early. She got late in the story. Boaz experiences the providential blessing of God. His workers say, may God bless you. And does God bless him? I should say he does. He is a blessed man. Ruth shared in the kindness that, 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 that and, and Ruth shared her kindness with Boaz. This is what Boaz says. Boaz doesn't go, man, I'm so glad to have you because you're hot. He doesn't ever say that. He doesn't ever say that. He doesn't ever say, man, of all the pretty girls, I got the prettiest girl. Never says that. He says, you are so kind. The kindness that you've shown to, to Naomi, you have doubled for me. And it's almost like Ruth has gone, well, I've just had kindness poured out on me, and I've just given it back. This is the picture that we, that we have in Ruth. What a Beautiful. God, so Ruth experiences providential kindness, Hesed. And Boaz experiences providential blessing. It's the answer to the early prayer. And Naomi experiences the providential fullness. Remember, I'm empty, I'm empty, I'm empty. And every time something happens in the story, somebody brings Naomi stuff. I like that. Oh, yeah, let me do that. Oh, and take this to Naomi. Here's the lunch for Naomi. You make sure she gets some of this. Naomi's like, who gave you this? Boaz. Boaz, of all the men... Naomi has a lot of sense. She's like, Boaz, Ruth, get back over there and don't hang out with the young men. Hang out with Boaz. And then Ruth comes home almost unable to carry. But doesn't, this, doesn't the text always say, take this home to Naomi? The, the book could be named Naomi because she is the key character. Naomi experiences the fullness of God. Okay, did you track with this? So God, in three examples, shows us what it looks like to trust and obey. And three examples, he shows us what it looks like when you do trust and obey. God pours out hesed on you, pours out God's loving kindness on you. God pours out blessing on you. And then God pours out fullness on you. God doesn't remove Naomi's loss. It's always there like Job. But he fills and he fulfills. Take this back to Naomi. Now, here's the conclusion and it will take me a while to conclude, so don't put your shoes on yet. What are we to make of the thing that's tacked on the end of the story? What's that all about? It's like we're watching this drama, and it comes to an end, and it's so beautiful. It ends with Naomi holding the baby. Naomi's holding the baby. She's the nurse of the baby. And her friend's like, you are blessed. 
You have the complete family. It's better than the seven sons. You have Ruth. This is a beautiful picture. This is a, and it's so spare. Don't you love the literature of the Bible? Let me point it out again in case you missed it. You probably didn't, but, but the whole big part, you know, where you, that you're kind of looking forward to Ruth and Boaz getting together and having a baby. Look how sparse the language and how beautiful the language is in, in the Bible. So Boaz took Ruth. She be, this is verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. He went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. May his name be renowned in Israel. <laughs> Little did they know how that would be answered. He shall be to you as a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Naomi's old. And if you talk to Naomi in prayer meeting, if a pastor had said, Naomi, can you testify? Naomi would have said, is it okay if I just sit down? Pastor would say, you don't have to stand up, Naomi. Naomi's voice is trembling because she's old now. And she has this radiance about her because she's joyful. She's happy. She'd been through a terrible, terrible heartache. She lost a husband and she's lost two sons. She knows what it's like to be hungry, but she's giving great, great glory to God. And she says, don't be, feel bad for me. I'm full. I'm satisfied. Friend, God wants that for you. He wants to pour out his favor and blessing on you, his chesed. He wants to give you his blessing. He wants to show you his kindness. He wants you to experience his fullness. And this is what he's pointing out now. This is what the narrator's pointing out. When he adds the genealogy on the end, a genealogy of David, he connects David, you know, to Ruth and to Naomi. Uh, it, G God rewards those who trust him with blessing and kindness and fullness. But here's the thing that the, that the genealogy emphasizes. God rewards those who trust him with blessing and kindness and fullness, no matter who they are. No matter who they are. No matter how unlovely. No matter how unlikely. No matter how unrighteous. Ruth the Moabitess and this old widow God pours out favor and blessing and hesed and kindness. Jared Wilson wrote on this well. He says, why the genealogy? He wrote, trace the line. If you think the inclusion of poor widowed Moabite in Jesus' genealogy is scandalous, consider Boaz's own ancestor Tamar, who through trickery seduced Judah. What Wilson's pointing out, of course, is the similarity in the partial genealogy here, and what we pointed out before, the full genealogy or the symbolic full genealogy of Jesus that starts the nativity story in Matthew. It's like the, anybody would recognize them to be connected together then. And so he says, imagine, trace the line, if you think the inclusion of widowed Moabite in Jesus' genealogy is scandalous, consider Boaz's own ancestor Tamar, who through trickery seduced Judah. But you don't have to go that far back to get the scandal. Boaz's own mother was Rahab, or pregenitor, over six times referred to as the harlot in scriptures. But the harlot was redeemed. She, was, she too was redeemed per, to perpetuate the name, the name of Boaz and the name of Jesus. Keep going in that genealogy in Matthew, and you have Tamar, the seductress, Rahab, the harlot, Ruth, the Moabite, Bathsheba, the exploited victim of da King David's lust, even Mary, the virgin, must have had a shadow over her for a time, given the strangeness of her pregnancy to people and the expediency of her marriage to Joseph. So this is how Jared Wilson puts it. Do you know what this means? It means there is no sin so great that God cannot forgive. There is no brokenness so big that God cannot redeem. There's no sinner, no failure, no victim, no outsider so far gone that the sovereign hand of God cannot reach and rescue and revise history of their life. Jesus' genealogy shows us God can redeem anything, anyone, anywhere. God rewards those who trust him with blessing and fullness, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter how dark their past, no matter how unlovely, no matter how unlikely, 
Jew or Gentile, male or female, weak or, or, or poor or rich or widow or immigrant or powerless. And his reward is for those who trust him. It's infinitely beyond this life. It doesn't all get ironed out necessarily in this life. It's for those who trust him into the other country where he will make everything right when they couldn't see it. And even when you can't see it, you need to trust that he's doing something. So the full expression of the big idea would be, what's the point of the story? It would be God, Yahweh, rewards those who trust him. And Yahweh rewards anyone who, trusts, will, who will trust him. And Yahweh rewards anyone who trusts him forever and forever. And he, Yahweh uses things to reward those who trust him that aren't even miraculous. They're just the arrangement of providential circumstances. And this why we've called this message and this last act in the Advent drama of Ruth, the gospel of Ruth. Because if you think about it, the good news is this. You should be a faithful friend, and you should be pure, and you should be worthy, and you should be generous like Boaz, and you should care for the poor like Boaz, and you should persevere in hardship and bitterness like Naomi, and you should turn from sin and worshiping false gods, and you should serve God. But how many times have you failed, and you cannot adequately do that? Not perfectly. No, you haven't. I haven't either. But there is a Redeemer. There's one who can. There's one who will. There's one who did. He'll be born in Bethlehem. He'll be the greater David. He'll sit on David's throne. There was a girl born in Iran. Her life was sad. Her family was filled with false religion. It was a dark thing. One night, in order to find relief from it, she went to a party she didn't know people would be drinking. She started drinking and was impaired when someone pulled her into a room and misused her. That caused her great depression and confusion, and she couldn't tell anyone. And she didn't know what to do. Somebody told her about Jesus, but she didn't believe. She went on in her sadness and her brokenness and her confusion and her hurt until she thought over and over of ending her life. And then one night in her bedroom, lying on her bed, thinking of ways to end her life, a vision of Jesus appeared to her. She went back to church and began with, became a follower of Jesus. When her dad found out, he beat her, kicked her face, threatened her life. They called the police, and she began to actively try to be kind to her, her father since she'd come to follow Jesus and forgive her father and and to love him. And he's not a Christian yet, but sometimes he goes to church with her. And he stands silently beside her while she lifts up her hands and prays to God. God has shown his kindness to her. And he longs to show his kindness to you. Pour out his kindness on you. You know, you're unworthy. Even though sometimes you're unlovely. Even though you're undeserving and really unlikely. But that's who Jesus came looking for at Christmas time. So when we lay down this beautiful story and we say to ourselves, only God can see what will happen when the simplest, most unlikely people trust him and obey him. Gather up the blessing of God. Think about this, that he gave Boaz and the kindness of God that he gave Ruth and the fullness of God that he gave Naomi and take those things in a big bundle to the New Testament and look around the New Testament for a while and what you'll find out is there's a word in the New Testament often used for people who are laden with the blessing of God and laden with the favor of God and laden with the kindness of God and laden with the fullness of God. The New Testament word we use is grace. And Jesus is the personification of God's grace gift, it means. Merry Christmas, here's your gift. Jesus, the Redeemer. Christmas is Christmas because God gave his son. His son gave his life. And all who believe receive grace upon grace and blessing of, of God like Boaz and the kindness of God like Ruth and the fullness of God like Naomi. And the blessing and the kindness and the fullness of God is in Christ. Merry Christmas. <laughs>